Ah. Final Fantasy Nine. 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 The ninth Final Fantasy. Oh my! Is this a Final Fantasy Nine retrospective? Never seen one of those before. You may be asking yourself, do we really need another one of these? Which, let's be fair, that's a dumb question since you already clicked on the video, but the answer is no, you don't. Especially since I'm not coming in to serve up any hot takes. I'm just here to reinforce what certain based individuals have already told you. It's a phenomenal game. One of the best. Just a life-changing experience. One of the greatest video games ever made. When the credits rolled, I had to stand up and start clapping. A wonderful experience and uh, a wonderful time in my life. One of my favorite Final Fantasies of all time. An astonishing, timeless masterpiece. Not only was it written in the stars, but science has proven it. Final Fantasy IX is the best one. So on today's retrospective, we're gonna take a brief look at the behind the scenes of developing one of the PlayStation 1's best JRPGs. The ingredients that made it such a solid game, why it endures today, and why it left such a strong impression on me growing up, going down as one of the most important games of my youth. However, what we're not going to do is say Final Fantasy IX is a perfect game or anything, as much as I'd love to say that even just for the memes. It is, in fact, not perfect. Not perfect. It's honestly very far from it. And 24 years after its release, it's even easier to see why and how. So you will hear a certain degree of criticism in today's video. But please keep in mind as the video plays that these criticisms do not preclude Final Fantasy IX from being one of my all-time favorite games and one of the games I consider to be most special to me. And just as a forewarning, contrary to what you might think based on the length of this video, this isn't exactly some giant deep dive video discussing the meaning behind every piece of visual storytelling and parallels between certain characters and world lore or anything like that. This video also will not recap the entire story as many retrospectives do these days. And I aim to make this a video that's relatively light on spoilers and easily accessible to even those who have never played a Final Fantasy game before. So some things will get discussed in a fair bit of detail where others, for the sake of not spoiling the game or overextending a video that's already quite long, may pass by with hardly a sentence dedicated to them. I'm not personally a fan of giant essayist type videos videos myself and I don't aim to make them. Sometimes my videos just get a little long is all. In an effort to control the scope of the video, some things will simply not get much dedicated screen time. It's not that there isn't more I could say, I just might not really want to say much more than I do here. Or let's be real, I don't want to edit this video for any longer than I already have to. So with expectations set, let's look at Final Fantasy IX, one of the games that means the absolute most to me and what I consider the best one in the series. But of course, you know, like, comment, subscribe, check out the second channel, it's kind of trash, but you know, it's, I guess, maybe fun trash, maybe just trash trash, you be the judge of that. Now this video will begin with a look back at the development of this game leading up to its release and the reception of it, followed by an extensive but not too deep sort of exploration of the, the story, the combat, the side content, all that fun jazz, the, you know, the art, the world, the characters, themes. Again, extensive but not too deep. I'm not gonna try to get very pretentious with this video and go in depth about all the hidden meaning of, uh, you know, oh, what does the play in the beginning of the game mean? That's, that's a different video for somebody else. Then, finally, we will close with why and how, uh, 24 years after its release, Final Fantasy IX remains such an important game to me, and why it likely will for the rest of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my retrospective on Final Fantasy IX, and this is the story of its development. It may look like a harmless bagel toaster, but inside is a deadly donut. Seconds from now, it'll be about 10 minutes till the ball drop, and you can feel it in the air. There's a buzz. You hear that sound? Yeah. They know it's gonna happen. It was the year 2000. After a long and tumultuous journey, Final Fantasy had established itself in the West not just as a successful IP, but as an IP that lived up to Square's lofty expectations. This was in no small part thanks to the launch of Final Fantasy VII, a game Square believed so little in the success of in the West that they themselves pulled out of localizing it, surrendering the responsibility to Sony Entertainment. With Sony helming the project, more money than normal would be poured into advertising the game in the West, and as it would turn out, the high-tech world of Final Fantasy VII was the perfect game to showcase the high-tech capabilities of Sony's new home console, 
the PlayStation 1, known at the time as simply the PlayStation or PSX prior to its launch. Every year there's one game, you know what I mean, the game everybody's gotta get. Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII's level of success in the West was unprecedented, with its main character Cloud Strife and even the antagonist Sephiroth becoming something of poster boys for the genre. But in saying all this, it's worth noting that Final Fantasy VII's reputation precedes it, and to talk more about that game's history would be superfluous for this video. To say the least, Final Fantasy VII was huge, and the franchise's new direction was promising and exciting, leaving behind its traditional dark fantasy for a world where might and magic fused with future tech and politics. Something Final Fantasy VI began to explore and established a lot of the staples of, but something Final Fantasy VII took and ran with. When it came time for the sequel, Square more than doubled down on this change of direction, placing Final Fantasy VIII in a world almost overwhelmed by its technology and advanced civilizations, pushing the traditional fantasy elements further into the background. Final Fantasy VIII, while divisive today, was still a massive success at launch, but after three games, pushing in this same direction, series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi decided it was enough, and that it was time to return Final Fantasy to its roots, and thus began the envisioning of Final Fantasy IX beginning its development as 8 was coming to a close, serving as the last Final Fantasy game they would develop on the PlayStation 1, even though it would be launching after the release of the PlayStation 2. And as the last single digit numbered entry the series would ever see, it was important to the development team that they give it a sense of closure, a sense of nostalgic reflection, and a sense of coming full circle. Though they would return with Final Fantasy 9 to a medieval setting, stating the depth and drama of the traditional European backdrop as very alluring to them, they wanted to make sure their cast of characters remained relatable, and that the issues concerning their fantasy world and imaginary society would reflect that of a real society and give players ways to navigate issues they may face in real life. One of the series' most persistent icons, the Black Mage, would be key in pulling all of this off, allowing players to assume the role of the seemingly helpless, lost, and bewildered childlike Phoebe. To really send home the feeling of a fantasy world, they looked to the Jim Henson movie The Dark Crystal for inspiration while creating creature and character designs and locations. And it shows. The world is filled with wonder, creativity, and inspiration. Final Fantasy IX, though it has a lot going on and a lot of statements one can interpret from its subtext, was built around a theme inverse to that of Final Fantasy VII's, where VII was about death, IX was about life, or rather, living. How characters direct their lives and learn to live to the fullest despite their tribulations. Though in saying this, it needs to be acknowledged that exploring life as a concept cannot be done to its full extent without also exploring the opposite side of its same coin. Exploring how life thrives or diminishes in the shadow of death. And so the theme of the game is really one of life and death. During the writing and creation process, characters and world elements were talked about and brainstormed openly, and over time, a synergy among the creative staff was formed, as though they were one mind creating the project, aware of what each other were thinking and feeling. This was a rare and welcome thing, especially rare considering the wide variety of social backgrounds many of the working staff had come from, with American and Japanese branches coming together to work on the game in one centralized, Hawaiian-based studio. Hiring from an American pool of talent, however, did prove a challenge. As Square put out the hiring call in the West, they came to find that game development was a rather undeveloped field with not much available talent to pull from. A great deal of their staff ended up coming from a background in Hollywood film production. This, however, turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as the infamous film Final Fantasy The Spirits Within would also be a local production. Although it's up in the air these days if Square would consider their movie efforts a blessing in any way. One thing is for certain, though. Even if the movie didn't make bank or win the hearts and minds of the critics, it was a monumental leap forward in the world of CGI filmmaking. Perhaps a leap forward taken just a little too early. The days in Hawaii were long and stressful, as any game development process is, but with the coastal beaches, tropical flair, and welcoming sun, stress was easy to relieve at day's end, and the staff found themselves having a lot of fun along the way and getting tans the likes of which they had never had before. At one point in the throes of development, they found they were coming up short on staff and reached back out to their Tokyo branch to request additional aid. But as Toshiyuki Itahana recalls, that meeting did not quite go according to plan. 
We were so suntan that they said, you guys are clearly not working. You're just having fun. You need to put your nose to the grindstone and actually work. So they didn't really give us any more people. Despite not getting the additional support they wanted, Final Fantasy IX had a relatively smooth production, all things considered. The team would often state they made little to no compromises along the way and realized their vision in its near entirety. As the release date drew near, Final Fantasy fans were getting concerned that Final Fantasy IX would be the last fully offline Final Fantasy title. And when asked about this in interviews, the development staff didn't do too much to quell their concerns beyond stating, if you don't like our online features, let us know. Though Square may have had a plan for a fully online series following Final Fantasy IX, this thankfully never came to fruition, and they seem more than content to keep their online and offline offerings separate. Ready for release, Square began their advertising campaign and promotions, the likes of which made clear how far Square had come as a company, what they were able to achieve, and who was interested in working with a company whose games were once considered niche. Continuing a promotion that began two years prior, figures of Final Fantasy IX characters were included with purchase of Coca-Cola products in Japan, and they were advertised with a wonderful, lighthearted, and charming commercial. This promotion would later be continued with Final Fantasy X. Promotions like this were fairly commonplace Place around the time, with a similar, albeit lesser, promotion for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace taking place at Taco Bell restaurants across America. Sadly, however, this Coca-Cola advertisement for Final Fantasy IX was region locked to Japan. With the internet becoming more and more advanced as well, Final Fantasy IX had advertising in the form of a website that functioned as an interactive guided tour, not all too unlike a point-and-click adventure game. This tour introduced you to the characters and world of Final Fantasy IX, and is a cool little time capsule for the year it came out in. However, the versions I found of it on the Wayback Machine today no longer function, giving a black screen anytime you click off the landing page. Putting as much steam behind the release as they could at the time, Final Fantasy Fantasy IX released to high critical and fan reception. However, as the dust settled after Final Fantasy IX's launch, a picture became clear. The sales were ultimately disappointing, selling less than the two games that preceded it. Final Fantasy IX was what many would consider Hironobu's magnum opus, and the game Hironobu himself considered the quintessential defining Final Fantasy experience, a view he held not just then, but still to this day. The next Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy X on the PlayStation 2, would be helmed by Yoshinori Kitase and proved to be a massive success. Hironobu, having accomplished his greatest work with Final Fantasy IX and having his ongoing tasks at Square seem to only hold diminishing returns, such as the release of the aforementioned financial disaster Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, was conflicted and decided in 2003 to bow out of the company and pursue his ambitions with a self-made studio called Mistwalker a studio he set up in none other than Honolulu, Hawaii. A lot of events that led up to this occurred behind closed doors and were never widely publicized. But with the lessening return on investment for his projects and seeing other directors make much larger profits using the Final Fantasy brand, it's not the least bit surprising to see things go down this way. At the end of the day, Square is a business and money is the bottom line. Though I would never say Hironobu had been disgraced, as his work, I believe, speaks for itself, it's hard to say investors would see things the same way. And so, Final Fantasy IX wouldn't just remain Hironobu's magnum opus, it would actually be his last Final Fantasy game. At least until Lost Odyssey, which might actually be the best Final Fantasy game, but I digress. <laughs> I got an itch. <sighs> Eyelash or something. Final Fantasy IX, by all accounts, had a remarkably smooth development process. And I want to stress here, like, really stress, that this sort of thing is far from the norm for the industry. Not just now, but like, even back then, 24 years ago. Generally, even when things are going their smoothest, you'll still hear horror stories about R&D or something get, getting held up on developing, I don't know, a smoke effect or something that ends up tripling the R&D budget. You know, crazy stuff like that. But not with Final Fantasy IX. They knew what the system was capable of, and they knew what the story needed, and those two things matched. To quote a quite prominent figurehead in the gaming space, when it comes to Final Fantasy IX, at least its development, it just works. So let's look now at the story of what one of gaming's most in- What is this f***ing line? Of what one of gaming's most important figureheads, Hironobu Sakaguchi, considers his greatest and best realized works. Ladies and gentlemen, the story of Final Fantasy IX. Without too much depth, and without too many spoilers, okay? It's just the early stuff. Let's get into it. So, 
This feels kind of like one of the, the last hurrahs of the, the Sakaguchi style of Final Fantasy. There was a lot of humor in it, and I don't think people talk about that enough. I love the humor in Final Fantasy IX with all of the different characters. Wacky and out there character designs like rat people and the black mages and whatever the heck Armorant is. If I'm being honest, its story does not get the love that it deserves. Impactful, emotional story. I was just straight up hooked the entire time. It even goes so far as to say that for me, it is the best PS1 Final Fantasy. This wasn't some crummy Final Fantasy VIII or anything. Don't get me wrong, I love seven and eight. This was back to the basics, back to what I loved. But there's just something about Zidane and Vivi and the journey that they go on in Final Fantasy IX that just really stands out to me. Everything that I know and love about the series came back for me. I honestly, didn't think that I was going to like Final Fantasy IX, and I thought, man, this just, I don't know, kind of feels like a step backwards. But leave it to Sakaguchi to just bring the strange and absolutely hook me. Final Fantasy IX begins fairly simply, but with a dash of majesty rarely equaled in the genre. We open in the city of Alexandria. As we explore the city first as the dark mage Vivi, we immediately get a dose of what this world has to offer, and it's frankly just a wonderful experience. The streets of Alexandria are a bustle of activity with loads to do and see. The NPCs that populate the streets are a diverse cast of fantasy races that immediately sparks the imagination and sets the tone for what promises to be an extravagant journey, equal in its level of heart and tenderness as it is to its mystique and high-tension action sequences. There's a feeling of nostalgia here, though, distilled in the entire premise and presentation of the opening act. As a feeling and ingredient to the tone, it's almost intangible in nature. As if this nostalgia could exist regardless of the absence of any experience prior that you may feel nostalgic towards. Couple this with Vivi's almost directionless wandering looking for something they themselves can place no tangible image on, a rare and conflicting feeling of desiderium sets in. And despite the celebration that seems to exist all around you, a profound sadness or loneliness can be felt as well. Somewhat contrasting to Vivi's exploratory plotting, our story's leading man has a very clear and tangible goal ahead of him. Zidane, a humanoid thief with a monkey tail, in company of his fellow band of bandits, are in the midst of a plan to kidnap the princess of Alexandria, Garnet. The intent is to utilize the city's currently ongoing annual celebration and a thematically poignant play as a cover, disguising themselves as a theater troupe to gain access to the castle and get closer to their target. However, things take an unexpected but welcome turn when Sedane finds the princess, only to discover she herself was trying to escape the castle. Garnet cooperates with the kidnapping plan, using it now as little more than a clever ruse to accomplish her own breakout. But the plan doesn't go off completely without a hitch. Steiner, one of Garnet's royal guards, whose staunch dedication to her protection is only matched by the alleged rust that decorates his armor, refuses to allow Garnet to leave with Zidane. Despite that, however, he is powerless to stop her, so he accompanies the troop on her breakout so that he might ensure her ongoing protection, arguing with the group every step of the way and doing his best to encourage they gain hold of their senses and return to Alexandria. Garnet, on a mission, of course, refuses. She seeks passage to a friend and ally of her family's who she believes can help with a perceived corruption she feels going on within the castle walls and amongst her own family members. And Steiner, of course, is forced to accompany her. Vivi, who also found his way into the group of misfits, finds himself in a new conflict that begs resolution as well. This when the group comes under the attack of black mages that bear a striking resemblance to himself. These black mages, who come in seemingly two different forms with different levels of sentience, seem to only understand one thing, a direct Directive to carry out orders of chaos and tyranny. Vivi, alone and with no understanding of himself, his past, or his own people, sees this group as his only clue to solving the mystery of his past, and he'll do what he must to navigate their evils to find a meaningful path towards illumination. 
To continue from here would be to get into spoiler territory. And though this game is over 20 years old at this point, it's not my aim to ruin it for others, especially if it isn't needed to say what I want to within the scope of this video. But to not comment at all on the further content or pacing would be doing a disservice to the title, so I will leave it at the following for now. The story from here stays fairly linear, but ticks along at a steady pace, introducing new characters and bringing the party to new locations and facing ever-evolving conflicts all along the way. Rivalries come in and out, and the party develops amazing chemistry with one another, keeping Zidane at their core as a sort of glue that holds them all together, however brash he can be at times. For as dark as the game can get, and it does get rather dark, it remains an ever tender experience. No dark shadow is cast without the light of innocence and purity to give it contrast. The villains of our adventure prove time and time again that they are a power not to be taken lightly. And though we never quite reach the destructive levels seen from Kefka in Final Fantasy VI, certain displays of power bring him to the front of the mind. By the time the credits roll, I can see some players maybe feeling the end had fizzled out and that the final boss was maybe a bit anticlimactic. But up until that very final boss, Final Fantasy IX solidifies itself as one of the series' most endearing adventures with the most to say to its audience. Final Fantasy IX wasn't just a great JRPG. It was an important one, historically and socially, but most importantly, intrapersonally for anyone who is willing to pay attention, to engage with its message and themes, and to pick up what the game was putting down. Final Fantasy IX to me is the perfect example of creating a love letter to a series while at the same time carving out your own niche. The setting, yeah, I mean, it's a high fantasy setting, but it's one of the most unique and awesome looking high fantasy settings that's ever been made. It's just incredible. The end cap to an era, sort of a reprisal of the Final Fantasy 1 through 5 strictly medieval settings. It's so charming, it's so whimsical, it's great, amazing music. I, I just love it. The soundtrack, oh my gosh. I, this was Uematsu's last solo Final Fantasy, and he just went to town on this thing. Earlier, we discussed a little bit about the game's opening town, Alexandria but this hardly skims the surface of the title's visual design and creativity, with art provided by Shuko Murase, Toshiyuki Itahana, and Hideo Manaba, who served as the art director. The world, both in its lovingly crafted environments, as well as its characters and many races and creatures, and even in its dungeons, many of which contain unique gimmicks and progression ideas, showcases a level of creativity and imagination that's kind of become lost in the genre. Part of me feels like worlds this imaginative don't exist as much anymore as assets now are designed to be re used and retextured as much as possible, and the budgets required to design a JRPG world where every screen is wholly unique would be astronomical. During this era of JRPGs, however, when backgrounds were all hand-painted by default, there was no such thing as saving money by reusing content, or at least the amount that could be saved was so much lower it didn't make sense not to just go all out and be as creative as possible. Having said all this though, I did mention the Dark Crystal was a big source of inspiration for this game's world and visual identity. And it would probably be wrong not to point out at least a little bit that Final Fantasy IX really does owe its world to the Dark Crystal. Similarities between locations, character, and race designs are easy to make. I mean, heck, Zidane looks to be a remix on the Dark Crystal's Gelfling designs. Eiko even more so. But the world is no lesser because of it, especially considering there was little else like it in the world of video games at the time. And frankly, even now where we have a legitimate, realized Dark Crystal video game, there still isn't. Equally responsible for bringing this world to life, however, as well as raising the emotional and dramatic stakes of the narrative, is the music. Of course, beautifully composed by series veteran Nobu Uematsu, a man who has always been on the edge of innovation in the world of video game composition, pushing the envelope of what people thought was possible on retro sound chips, creating emotive melodies and striking soundscapes. Final Fantasy IX may not contain what the average person might consider Uematsu's most challenging and tech-defying composition. That credit probably goes to his work on Final Fantasy VI, but it is one of the soundtracks I feel best suits the world and story it was created for, at times merging with a narrative to be as distinct of a character as any of the moving people we see on the screen. Contrasting the previous two Final Fantasy games where Uematsu was required to make a more 
grounded soundtrack set in a more realistic sort of story and environment, Final Fantasy IX returned to a high fantasy setting, and with that, Uematsu was given free reign to just go wild. When writing the compositions, Uematsu took a trip to Europe and Germany and explored old cathedrals and castles to try and get a feel for the period and style of music he was going to write. However, not everything was that classical European high fantasy style of music. Due to the nature of the story and the fantasy setting, he was able to just make goofy tracks and throw them in there, more characteristic themes for the characters. Really, whatever he wanted to do, he was pretty much allowed to do, and when he was done writing, Final Fantasy IX ended up with 160 tracks. Now, some of those were variations, but a lot of them were original from scratch material. A couple of the tracks were also new arrangements of old Final Fantasy tunes, and this was more or less done to reinforce the idea of Final Fantasy IX being a full circle type of moment for the series. Uematsu's music is the music of the world in Final Fantasy IX. It is the culture, the story, the arts, and the history. It is the beating heart of emotion, the piercing will of sorrow, the driving force of will and determination. It is the air that fills the universe so all other aspects of its creation can breathe and thrive. But just as Uematsu's music nourishes the universe and gives it life, the universe itself is the muse for which the music gets created. Uematsu's work transcends the position usually held by music in the visual arts, and it represents a strong symbiotic relationship between himself and the other creative departments who worked on the title, coming together to display a rare beauty in the delicate marriage of all artistic aspects video games have to offer. It is an impressive and rare demonstration of how cyclical the support system for convergent artistic mediums can really be. Also, there's hippo people in the game. Uh, lots of other cool races too, but there's hippo people. You think they listen to hippo hop? Now that we've talked a little bit about the story and world, it's time I think we look at the characters that play out the story, the characters that fill the world. Because it's through these characters that the themes of the game are truly explored. And it's the various themes of the game that I think make Final Fantasy IX a truly timeless and enduring experience. Final Fantasy IX is a celebration of existence and showing ourselves and others to cherish each individual life, that each individual life has meaning no matter how little or how small it actually is. Zidane and Dagger, Steiner and Vivi, they're all just really awesome characters. Pure character development. I just, I love when games leave room for the characters to just grow and develop. It's, it's incredible. Pretty obvious it's so that this game means a lot to me. Vivi in particular is one of my favorite characters in any game and the journey he goes on from not even knowing who or what he was to discovering his people, to finding a purpose in his short life really resonated with me and is a story that stuck with me throughout the years even now. And the first time I saw Vivi pop on the screen, I knew I was in for a really big treat and he was walking down the street and I'm like, oh my God, and then the airship passes over. I still get shivers thinking about that. Shivers thinking about that. It was a classic moment I didn't know I'd be looking back on like 20 years later. As mentioned earlier, the central theme the writers chose for the game was that of life. Generally, how characters go about living and the different ways they all approach life. Naturally, of course, the characters and themes are intimately interwoven, such that talking about the themes makes it impossible not to discuss the characters and how they live. So. How do they live? Our main character Zidane, unaware of their origins, tries hard not to take life too seriously and just go with the flow. He's a welcoming character, even if he is sarcastic, rude, and at times hot-headed. He's the glue that brings and holds together the remaining cast, pushing them to reach their potential or giving them space when needed. But these aren't traits that are just inherent to his being. Rather, they're traits born of compensation. Compensation for the tribulations he himself had endured. Tribulation that are hard to face. Life for Zidane would be considerably more difficult if he were to take responsibility for it and actually face his concerns. He's something of a vagabond, always on the run, not from anybody in particular, but from his past and the mystery of his very being. 
Now, before we continue here, I should probably note that this is all in relation to the North American uh, localization of the game. As we found out sort of recently, or at least it became a big controversy, the original uh, script, especially for Zidane, had been changed a lot uh, versus the original Japanese version. Zidane in Japanese and Zidane in, um, we'll say, North American English, not quite the same character. For better or worse, I do really like the North American Zidane. It's always kind of crummy when this sort of thing happens, but it is what it is. This is the character I grew up with, uh, so this is the version of the character that I wanted to talk about today. Now on to Garnet. Garnet, the young princess and queen-to-be, is also haunted by a mysterious past and a looming, uncertain future. Thrust into a world of responsibility ahead of her age, she's forced to leave youth and innocence behind and make the tough decisions that a country of people will rely on her for. Caught between the duty to her people and her duty to her family, as well as the draw of innocence and the need for maturity, she is one of the cast's most conflicted characters. Where in this life is space left for the songs of one's heart? How and when can she be true to herself and fulfill the obligations she holds to herself? Does her life grant her those opportunities? And if not, are they opportunities that she needs to make space for? Garnet's Knight Steiner, Diner? I hardly know her, is in a similar situation honor and duty bound to a fault to protect his princess no matter the cost. But this duty is all encompassing in his life and leaves him with no space to explore other relationships or be open or accepting towards others. He lives his life solely in servitude, but a life of servitude is no life at all, no matter how much he tries to convince himself otherwise. And so the question remains, does he neglect his true calling what he really wants to uphold his honor and duty to his princess. Vivi, the black mage like Zidane, is also unaware of their history. However, contrasting to Zidane, Vivi makes their life about the pursuit of that missing knowledge and learns in the process about the realities of life and death, understanding that someday they too will die. Thoughts on these topics can be all-consuming. Vivi's character arc is one about learning to live with realities that cannot be changed, about the discovery of self and understanding the control one has over their own being their own life and their own fate. Kina is an interesting character, however lacking in depth this creature is. They seem solely driven by the desire to try new foods, and for this reason they join Zidane and their party as they travel to new, exotic locations trying various local delicacies along the way. But in relation to the game's themes, life and living, not everybody lives a complicated life. Kina's method of living is one of simplicity, and that in and of itself reinforces the broad scope of the theme they aim to explore. Eiko is almost a twin character to Garnet in the sense she's also bound to duty to uphold her place of birth. More than familiar with a life of solitude, however, Eiko, unlike Garnet, does not let responsibility destroy her ability to answer the songs of her heart, throwing herself fully into the pursuit of her own desires, however inappropriate they may be. The example she sets with the changes she makes in her life being of utmost importance to Our Lady Garnet. Amaranth is what you might call the edgy one. He has a chip on his shoulder and is used to the life of a lone wolf. Living for himself, he does as he pleases within his malleable code of ethics. Not quick to trust others, demanding first they prove themselves as his equal or greater, he maintains a guarded approach to life. And lastly, Freya. Freya's life has already seen much adventure, but her adventure continues on in search of lost love and in pursuit of honor among her friends and family. Freya is probably the one I can talk about the least for spoiler reasons, but suffice to say she is the embodiment of classical romantic valor. Though this cast of characters explores the themes of life and living very well, it's in the bringing together of these characters I think the game steps into exploring a different territory. To quote a certain fast driving and furious legend, much of Final Fantasy IX is about family. The family that, for better or worse, we know, the family that, for better or worse, we don't, and the family that, for better or worse, we choose. Through these characters, we explore the effects families have on us, passively and directly, what responsibilities we do or do not bear to them, and the blurred line that forms in the middle, what responsibilities we don't bear, but we shoulder the burden of anyway. The power of family and the companionship it's meant to bring supersedes most forms of logic, and it threatens to be the greatest of pleasures 
pleasures and joys, as well as the harshest of punishments and suffering. While the main story gives plenty of time to show each facet of the familial life this cast builds together, how they lift each other up and guide each other down the hard paths they need to go down with support and love, tough or otherwise, it's in my favorite feature of this game I think we get to explore the game's themes in the most meaningful of ways. Of course, I am talking about the active time events. Not to be confused with active time battle, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Active time events are social events that take you away from your current POV character to see how other characters you've come across are living their lives at those very moments. Active time events can be anything from a character simply wandering around town to members of your party getting married while you're not looking. While many of these events are funny and charming, they're also, at all times, sincere and endearing. So many active time events can be passed off as simply mundane character vignettes, and to many people that may sound critical. But I ask, what is more mundane than everyday living and life? Also, at what point did the mundane aspects of life ever lack for beauty? True, real, honest beauty, the beauty of living. Seeing these characters interact on their own and with each other, separate of the main POV characters and outside of the general quest objectives, makes them feel so much more alive and realized. Active time events, I'd argue, are one of Final Fantasy IX's biggest strengths and most well-executed ideas. And it's not simply because we get character vignettes, those aren't all that uncommon in RPGs, but it's because the focus of these vignettes reinforces the themes of the game and propels the characters to heights rarely equaled in the genre. For this reason, above all others, I believe Final Fantasy IX sticks the landing. It's why I believe the game has endured for so many years. Why it's still today the highest rated Final Fantasy game on Metacritic. Visuals, combat ideas, societal tendencies in general, you know, they tend to change over time. But an appeal to humanity, the draw to care for a character, that's timeless. It's consistent. That will never change. And for this reason, Final Fantasy IX will always be one of the series' most cherished entries. Combat, on the other hand, that maybe doesn't quite persist as well. Now, it's not bad, okay? Don't get me wrong, it's, it's not bad. It's quite far from it, in fact, but it's just, like, it's 24 years old, and, you know, it's... It's been 24 years, guys, and, and it, it does show. Okay, there's certain things that you might be comfortable with or expecting from combat now, that you're just not really gonna get or see reflected in Final Fantasy IX. Of course, because it's 24 years old, but it is 24 years old, and uh, because of that, we need to talk about it. Skit. Did he just use modern day as an excuse? I think he did. Can he do that? I don't know if you can do that. Well, I did. Final Fantasy IX uses what, at this point, had become the classic active time battle system, or ATB for short, with many of the unique ideas and systems of previous games stripped out or reworked. ATB, for those who have never experienced it, is a pseudo turn-based combat system where time is almost always in a state of motion, and characters' turn orders and speed are visualized in a meter down here. When the meter is full, the character that it relates to gets the opportunity to move. However, just because it's their turn and you can navigate your menus, that doesn't mean you're safe to take a few moments to formulate your strategy. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future, and the enemies can and will fly like an eagle straight into you, despite it quote unquote being your turn. ATB was designed as a means to inject more life into what had become the rather stagnant, older, static form of turn-based combat, requiring players to be more alert and alter their strategies on the fly. And although I personally don't have an issue with more static turn-based combat, ATB definitely achieves what it sets out to do. But with Final Fantasy IX, some of its shortcomings are a little more apparent, namely the accidental downtime it frequently creates. See, it is possible, and often likely in fact, that speed meters and turns may all click into place around the same time. So after everybody takes their turn and their meters drop to empty, every combat participant is left waiting for the passage of time
time again, just vibing out in their idle animations. It can feel like watching paint dry at times, and it's frustrating knowing full well that there was a simple solution for this all along. Instead of making everybody wait, they could have just made the meters jump ahead to the next available turn, you know, to keep the combat flowing. There are some options to manipulate how ATB does or does not work in combat, but nothing actually gets rid of this issue. After waiting through long load screens for combat to start, at least they're long anytime you enter a new area and start your first battle, that drag to wait for anybody to be able to move, well, it drags. It's honestly probably the biggest black mark on the game, but combat outside of this is still pretty solid. As mentioned, it's as close to a traditional ATB as we can get from ATB's inception. You attack, guard, use items and special abilities, and your combat participants can be placed on front and back lines to manipulate their offensive and defensive capabilities. Most characters have unique class or racial skills that play into battle in interesting ways, such as Zidane's Thief and Rogue skills, which allow him to steal gear and resources from the enemies that you fight, or Kina's Blue Mage glutton skills, allowing them to devour enemies at low HP and absorb new permanent skills in the process. Also, Kina fights with a fork, which is just awesome. But by far the most unique thing this battle system does, this battle system that was designed to be more traditional, mind you, is how you acquire abilities. Abilities which, to me, feel like the real bread and butter of your character's build. These are the immune to poison, auto health regen, fast leveling type things that you get to set to your characters. And while I say this is something unique, I don't really mean that this hasn't been done before. In fact, it has many times, but it's the thing that separates this from most other turn-based games. So with few exceptions, abilities come from the gear you equip. Most gear will have two to three abilities, and provided your character is compatible with these abilities, so long as the gear remains equipped, the abilities are active. Once a piece of gear is unequipped, its abilities deactivate. However, through the prolonged use of a piece of gear, its abilities can be learned and transferred to the character, no longer requiring the gear to be equipped. Once learned, however, the ability isn't just active by default. Each ability costs ability points to equip, or AP for short. Each ability costs a different amount based on the perceived value of said ability, and each character has a different amount of AP they can work with, which increases as the game goes along. Though the system is built with balance in mind, it is not a hard system to break, with some abilities by their very nature being completely overpowered, and the finding and unlocking of these abilities is not exactly difficult and can guarantee that you steamroll even the final boss. As a substitute to the limit break, Final Fantasy IX employs the Trance Meter. The meter charges gradually and once full causes your character to transform taking on a magical golden aura and altering their costume and appearance. Trance mode lasts only a few turns and gives you access to a slew of new, stronger than average abilities and boosts various stats, which, while great, this isn't a very well implemented part of combat. Unfortunately, having no control over when you enter trance mode leads more often than not to trance modes going to waste, and when you do want to use one, you rarely ever get it. Trance mode would have been considerably better if you could just hang on to the charge and activate it when you saw fit. Interestingly enough though, trance mode isn't just a gameplay mechanic. Trance is also used as a narrative device at certain points in the story, and I for one love seeing this marriage of story and mechanics. It's a rather rare thing, but honestly, I understand why. <laughs> why don't they just use a phoenix down on her? <laughs> so stupid. But seriously, it's an ATB system with all the usual bells and whistles and weird quirks you can expect from Final Fantasy's constant need to evolve and be different. If you like ATB, you'll like the combat in Final Fantasy IX, especially if you liked, say, Final Fantasy IV's approach, which I find this is most similar to, except that maybe money and thus gear and consumables comes much cheaper in Final Fantasy IX. It's probably Probably worth noting as well that there's a synthesis system for making new gear and some really good equipment can be found through this system, but it's not the most intuitive or interesting thing to engage with. Similarly, there's a lot of gear you can get using Zidane's Thief abilities, but the success rates for acquiring some of them are kind of absurd. Honestly, to the point where I would say only the truly insane should attempt to get some of the gear this way, especially where there's typically much easier, albeit later ways to get the same gear. For me, it requires a level of patience 
or rather acceptance of monotony that I just don't feel joy having to employ. It's too tedious. So it's not something I do myself. But aside from those items, I do like using Zidane for extra resource gathering so I can hoard even more money that I don't need. Cause let's face it, the real power fantasy in RPGs isn't the insane abilities killing God at the end of every other game. It's the Scrooge McDuck style of hoarding. Hoarding more crap than you'll ever need, not selling weapons and gear that you got at level one, and hanging on to all of your best consumables until the final boss because maybe I'll need it there. And then when you get there, you're like, well, shit, I made it this far without using them. I can make it a little bit further. And then you never use them, do you? You never use them. And I never use them. And I don't know what they do. And I don't know if they break the game because I never use them because I'm just too good at video games. <laughs> And while I love the combat and the boss battle themes, how they kind of chug along, borrowing from the old themes we established in the older Final Fantasy games, one song that, you know, recurs most Final Fantasy games, the Victory Fanfare tune, this is one I just don't really love uh, Final Fantasy IX's rendition of. It's discordant and depressing and downplayed and I think that's the intent, but I just, you know, I kinda want the hype. This, this ain't hype. The only other thing I think is really worth noting here is the features the remaster packs in. Accessibility features, or what in other generations would have been called cheats. cheats. There's four that you can toggle on and off at will from the pause menu. The ability to disable random encounters, the option to make every attack do max damage, an auto battle mechanic, and a fast forward function, which really makes me appreciate how the Legend of Heroes games had this activate. Being a single button press or hold instead of this wonky pause menu business, which makes turning it on and off anything but swift and responsive. From the config menu, there's more options, but these have a permanent effect on your file and will disable your ability to gain trophies. But if you're just looking for a super casual quick run through this classic RPG, options for max skill, max level, and magic stones, and all abilities can be activated. B asterisk? I don't, I don't know what the... Uh, bold. I guess I was trying to write something in bold. Anyway, these abilities, these um, cheats, as they were, are useful beyond just combat. They can really make accessing some of the game's side quests and more hidden content a lot easier. Like the sword you can only collect by reaching one of the game's final dungeons in 12 hours or less. But rushing the game, you know, even with these cheats, getting that sword, it's not my kind of play style. So this is still content that I'm just never gonna see. When I play Final Fantasy IX, like I'm in it for the long haul, I wanna play Final Fantasy IX. I, I don't want to play go get the sword, you know? One thing I do get to see, however, in uh, my playthroughs is this segue to the part of the video where I talk about the side content and other junk. Here it is. While Final Fantasy IX has side quests like most RPGs do, the normal mission-based stuff is kind of few and far between and quite often hidden. Acquiring these quests will require the player to keep good tabs on the NPCs they come across and retread loads of old and optional areas in search of new things. An early quest can have you scouring the entire world map until the game's end, collecting items that alter the ending of the game. Another quest will have you seeking out spirit type encounters that you can fight to gain summons for Garnet. Another quest, more mundane in appearance, will have you gathering coffee beans for an NPC to acquire an unlockable key item. Normally, in review videos, I wouldn't bother to list the content of side quests in this manner, but to illustrate a point this time, I have. That point being, I just told you all of the game's side quests and it hardly took a minute. Well, not all of them, but most of them. Certainly the ones that stand out. At least, that's the impression I imagine the casual player will walk away with, as these are the side quests that I feel make themselves really obvious to the player. The ones where you're given a clear goal and explicitly told there's things for you to go and do. Things for you to work on throughout the course of your adventure and make a real effort towards. Not like the quest where you just give nuts to a moogle and move on whether you finish it or not. I'm talking about the real quests for real questin' men. But there are a few other hidden quests and events to find that mostly occur in the back half to the back quarter of the game. That all said, even considering the hidden quests, the game is still pretty light on actual side quests. This isn't really a complaint for me, however. Legend of Dragoon, one of my all-time favorite games, literally only has three or four quests. But while there are very few traditional side quests, 
there is an abundance of side activities, which I suppose you can take on beating them as a quest if you'd like, and it's sort of a side quest in that manner, but this stuff is a mixed bag. The worst of it is entirely optional, however, so it's not really any biggie. At various swamps throughout the game, you can catch frogs as Kina to unlock new gear, new items, and a secret boss. At each Moogle save point, you can take up the role of a postman, delivering mail back and forth from Moogle to Moogle across the Mognet. And like any good postman, you also get to read the mail. I find it super endearing to read how the Moogles talk to each other and how they discuss the current events of the world. The world of men and monsters according to the perspective of a Moogle is a really fun thing to engage with. Racing makes a brief appearance, as does Blackjack if you know how to find it, and Jump Rope. And if... <clears throat> and on the note of Jump Rope, if the reaction of the 200 lightning dodges in Final Fantasy X is anything to go by, people would not love this jump rope game. At least, not the completionists. See, the jump rope game is kind of bullshit, and when I come across bullshit like this, I say, that's some bullshit, and I move on. That's it, end of story. I get to continue having fun quickly. But for the diehards out there, those who have to complete every little bit of a game and get every little trophy along the way, Jump Rope will require you to perform 1,000 successful jumps to net the best reward the minigame has to offer. Further, there are loads of things to find out in the world by way of treasure, chocobo beaches, diving spaces, one pretty crazy super boss, and even a hidden town or two. There's a rare spawn monster that will quiz you on certain in-game lore, as well as friendly type monsters, special monster battles, an auction house to participate in, and a moogle that's nuts for nuts. Final Fantasy IX does not have a real focus on side quests, but through its side content, it frequently introduces small things for you to do to break up what could be the monotony of the typical read, walk, fight cycle of most RPGs. Now, I didn't cover all the side content that this game has to offer, but I did cover most of it, with the exception of one thing. What RPG would be complete without an in-world card game? This time we have Tetramaster. This is a weird, rather flawed game that I get stupidly addicted to every time I turn the game on. So much so that a lot of the footage I recorded for this video is useless for anything besides this segment. Tetramaster is a monster card battling game that takes place on a grid. Each card has arrows on it to show what direction it can attack and defend in, as well as a series of letters and numbers which, in a somewhat abstract fashion, shows the creature's magical and physical defense and attack capabilities. The goal of the game is to fill the board with monsters and flip the enemy monster's polarity to your own and aim to have more monsters under your control at the match's end than your opponent does. A winning game will allow you to keep one of the cards your opponent played that you flipped, and a perfect win, a game where every card is in your color, allows you to keep all of the monsters they played. But of course, if you lose, your opponent gets the same rewards. There's quite a bit to this little unassuming game. When taking over a card, for example, you can set off a chain reaction that flips the cards around the one you just took. Strategy runs fairly deep as well, from selecting a robust variety of cards prior to the match, and placing your cards on the board in places you think they can do the most damage or remain the safest. For example, placing a card's defenseless edge against the board's outer walls. But for as addicted to the game as I get, there is one thing that often drives me up the wall, and that would be the RNG. Though there are numbers on the cards that seem to indicate a creature's power, what it really represents is a range of power the creature can reach. When you attack or defend, there is an RNG calculation that occurs within the defined range as indicated on the card. And the ranges of a card with a number two on it and a card with a number three can have some overlap. So just because you have a card with a higher number, it doesn't actually mean you'll win. The RNG can, and often does, roll a lower number than the creature you're playing against whose base number is lower than yours. Now I get why it's built this way, as if the numbers themselves were completely static, this is a game players could consistently build the same deck with over and over again and win over and over again. The RNG is a method used to introduce randomness to prevent the game from becoming too predictable and breakable. And it works, all the props to them. But it can be absolutely maddening doing everything right and getting punished for it. But call me a masochist cause I keep coming back, baby! That is, of course, to say, I enjoy playing Tetramasters uh, very much. 
It's not the best card game in Final Fantasy history or anything, but damn does it hold my attention. And the music for it, it just makes me smile. I could hear one note from this tune and my mind would create a picture perfect image of that blue board. The grid and the words, cards sliding into place with that fun shook noise they make. Tetramaster is in my veins. And honestly, having Tetramaster in your veins is like having microplastics in your testicles. It was just meant to be. Overall, in regards to the side content, if Final Fantasy IX offered nothing nothing but Tetramaster, I would be happy with it. I have zero issues with extremely linear stories and adventure games. Now don't get me wrong, I like side questing, but I'm here primarily for the MSQ. So a game having very little on the side wouldn't be a huge negative for me. But Final Fantasy IX doesn't have very little on the side, at least not really. It just doesn't draw much attention to most of its side content, and it treats a lot of its side activities as transient breaks in the main story, not meant to be much of a distraction from it. It. Except for Tetramaster, that thing is distracting as fuck. And to build your game like this, that's perfectly fine. Because the main story is one I don't think you should be overly encouraged to constantly interrupt the action of. So while the content is there for you to do just that with, the decision for players to do that isn't really deeply encouraged, at least not beyond some loot that you'll get for completing things. But that loot is an invisible reward if you don't have a guide telling you what you're gonna get. So Final Fantasy IX I think is a game that does well to have its cake and eat it. Too. It provides side stuff for the players who seek it out and really want more from the world and experience, but it keeps the average player firmly focused on the story and characters that they so lovingly crafted and likely didn't want to lessen the impact of with too many distractions along the way, except for Tetramaster, which from me gets a pass no matter what it does, because Tetramaster is amazing and broken and crappy and it makes me angry and I love it. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Final Fantasy IX is really near and dear to my heart. It's probably my favorite one in the series. It's the most classic one in the series. And I first got it the summer that I graduated high school and was going on into college. I skipped practice for two days in a row because I wasn't quite sure what day Final Fantasy IX came out, but I wanted to be there day one uh, at the game store to get it. This I got when I was like a teenager, I think. This is one of those games that just it feels really special. Final Fantasy IX was one of the best examples of what that team at Square was really capable of. Thank you, Squaresoft, for crafting this timeless classic. And for two weeks, I ate bologna sandwiches to buy that and a PlayStation 1 screen. I'd rather go without food, you know what I mean, to, to play the latest Final Fantasy. And even just talking about it now makes me want to do another playthrough. It's just such a good, unique game in the series that every fan of the genre definitely needs to play once in their lives. Though Hironobu departed from Square shortly after the release of Final Fantasy IX, it didn't really mean Hironobu departed from Final Fantasy, as it is the mark of any great producer, director, writer, and creator that their works inspire a legacy. Hironobu's legacy and effect is still felt in the genre today, and while there will never be another Hironobu Sakaguchi, nor a team of creatives as in sync and defining as Square had all those decades ago, there will never be a day where the works of these amazing folks, Hironobu Sakaguchi, Hiroyuki Ito, Nobu Uematsu and their entire team of creatives fails to inspire. There will never be a day where their long-standing influence cannot be felt. As Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings was to Western and European fantasy, so too are Sakaguchi and his team to the Japanese role-playing game. All of them joining the godfathers of the RPG Mount Rushmore, earning their place alongside Dragon Quest's Yuji Horii and the brothers of their craft Akira Toriyama, Yoshitaka Mano, and many, many others. It's a big Mount Rushmore, guys, okay? Just don't worry about it. Final Fantasy IX today is still frequently discussed online and hailed as one of the greatest RPGs of all time. It is a game that many return to year after year, and new players who weren't even born for its release pick up and enjoy experiencing for the first time. It is one of the highest requested games for a remake anytime the opportunity for such a discussion comes up. And it seems more and more these days that a remake is not only inevitable, but possibly right around the corner. And this is something I don't fully know how to feel about. I said before the game wasn't perfect, and I stand by that. There's plenty of room for improvement, i.e 
better signposting for optional quests, more fleshed out backstories and character arcs for Freya and Amaranth, more meat on the bones for the hidden areas in the world lore, etc, etc. But there is something about this experience that simply cannot be recreated. These characters, this story, this music, the visuals, which yes, on the remaster were not cleaned up as well as they should have been, these things I feel are almost impossible to replicate and marry together as strongly as they had been the first time around. Final Fantasy IX turned out the way it did because the creatives in charge had a clear, unified vision and a synchronicity in their foresight. In today's big studio environments with today's big budgets and demands and massive teams, I'm not sure there's enough oil in the world to make the machine function this cleanly anymore. There's simply too many moving parts. Now that isn't to say a remake wouldn't be amazing, it very well could be. I just don't think it will ever be a better experience. At least not for those of us with rose-tinted glasses who grew up with the game and fell in love with it all those years ago. There's also rumors of an anime adaptation of this story and provided they stick to the script and knock it out in one season, I could see that actually turning out rather well. One thing, however, is certain. No matter how uncertain the future of Final Fantasy IX is as a property, the past, present, and future influence of this title will endure. Final Fantasy IX, despite what any sales would suggest of it, is a game worthy of its place in the JRPG pantheon. For now, and for always. From here, I want to talk about why Final Fantasy IX is so important to me, but this is a part of the video that I've really struggled to get down. I initially started work on this video in June of 2023, and wrote this script in August of that same year. But since then, I've been back and forth on how to complete this project, and I considered quite often whether or not I even should. A lot of things in my life have changed over the last year, and my opinions of what I should put here and how I should put what I want to have kind of changed with them. But what follows is something that I do think is important. And if what I have to say, what I have to tell following this um, helps anybody in life navigate anything any differently, any better, then I guess it's all worth hitting the publish button for. Now, if you've seen my Legend of Dragoon video or my Ring Fit Adventure video, you probably already know where this is going. And maybe some of you are tired of hearing about it. I don't really know. But for the next little while, until the end of the video really, we're gonna take a little trip back through my life. We're gonna talk about what it was like for me growing up. Only, I'm gonna give you a little more detail uh, this time than I did the previous two times I ever spoke about this. In saying that, this will also likely be the last time I bring this sort of thing up in any meaningful sort of way. While there will always be more stories I could tell and details I could give, the amount of stories and details I should give, should tell, are uh, diminishing. And my reasons for doing it are kind of diminishing as well, to be honest. Final Fantasy IX is the last game I have to talk about that really holds a massive importance to this time of my life. So I would like to get this discussion right, which means I have to have this big preamble forward before it. But I'm gonna do my best with the limited amount that I can tell you. And one last thing before we continue, um, this is the last time you're gonna see me in this video, so I'd like to say a huge thank you to Emma from Orbology. Correction, Emma from Orbal. Ology. Paige from the Fem Trooper, Just the Gems, David Vink, Gaming Productions, Super Derek RPGs, Taylor from the Gaming Shelf, Johnny from Happy Console Gamer, Bao Zakuraga, and Gaming with Spoons. Links to all of their channels can be found below. Please go give them some love. I really owe them for how this video turned out, and I am deeply thankful for all that they've contributed here. And I'd like to give a massive thank you to all of you who sat through the video to this point and will see it through to the end. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope the story that I'm about to tell helps some of you out in some way. I'll be seeing you all around. Thanks for watching. Let's start with a bit of background information on myself and what things were like for me growing up. I was the youngest of three children. At three years of age, my parents split up. One of my earliest memories was pushing myself between my brother and sister at the doorway of our house and watching as my mother and father fought in the driveway. I have no memories of my father actually living with us just that memory of the day he left. That was 1993. Memories from there are few and far between, and they're rarely anything good. My father couldn't be around much after that incident. Divorce is a messy thing, and it only got messier when another man came into the house a short while later. I would see my father occasionally during weekend visits at my grandfather's house. There would be times when my father had no car, 
and he would walk to my grandfather's late at night, in the dead of winter. He would show up to read us bedtime stories, with icicles in his beard and mustache when he arrived. One day, when he did have a car, he picked me up at home to go stay with him for the weekend. Part way to his house, as he asked me of all the things I packed, we realized I was short on some clothes. So we turned around and headed back home. Upon pulling into the driveway, the new man in the house pulled in right behind us. From the passenger seat, I watched as he yelled at my father, then punched him in the face multiple times, giving him two black eyes. My mother, who was not in either vehicle, and my later-to-be stepfather, tried to convince me that my father tried to run my stepfather off the road. I knew then, and still know now, that that was never the case. But what can a child do to make an argument against adults like that? I was hardly four years old by then. The truth was, the new man at home was violent and controlling. The next couple times I would see my father, he would be wearing sunglasses. For a number of years following, however, I wouldn't see my father much at all. This confused me more than anything. The man at home I wanted nothing to do with, and in my mind it was starting to seem the man I did want around didn't want me. So I would have entered school shortly after this. I was an odd kid even then. I didn't really struggle to make friends, but I only made a couple and decided that was enough. I didn't need to make more. Pokemon was taking off around this time, but I wasn't allowed to play it or watch it. The fact that it was as big as it was drew the attention of our local churches. Pokemon to them was false idolatry, so it was forbidden in my house. This made me a bit of an outcast at school and something I was ostracized for. But I was already being ostracized for something else already my height, and my weight. I was always the shortest, smallest, and lightest person in class. Not much has changed in that regard, I'm still a pretty small guy. I'm just a small guy that gets to the gym sometimes now. But still, it's something kids would grab onto and use how they saw fit. In a couple instances, this made me the target for bullying, but not too many times. A lot of classmates would give me nicknames due to this. Short stuff, shorty, wee man, little man, it was mostly meant with good intentions, but not by everybody. At home, being the youngest of three siblings, I was the smallest one there too. But being small and feeling small were two very different things. Not that I really understood that at the time. So. Things would only get worse with the new man at home. The abuse I first witnessed aimed at my father would start to appear within the walls of my own home. It was first aimed at my mother, at least verbally, but it was constant and every day. Seeing this all at such a young age, this just became part of normal living for me. I didn't understand the real issues I was witnessing, it's just how life was. Later, the abuse would extend to the children. As the youngest, I was the last in line to experience it, but it would come to me eventually, and the older I got and the longer I went on. On, the more aggressive it would become. On more than one occasion, I was left bloodied and bruised by my stepfather. I would be woken up in the middle of the night, pulled from my bed, and thrown into the walls. If there were reasons or causes, I no longer recall what they were. Not that it would excuse anything anyway. Our house was very old, and it was always a fear of mine that one of these days my brother or I would catch a stray nail head being thrown at the walls. That if we hit the wall in the wrong place or the wrong way, these nail heads would somehow make it through our skulls and we might not live through it. This isn't a fear that I think the average child experiences growing up, but it was something for me that was, again, just kind of normal. Now I won't speak in any further depth on the abuses of my siblings as it's not my story to tell, but we all faced and witnessed similar things in that house, and these examples aren't even the far end of the spectrum. To reiterate, these instances never registered to me as anything unusual. This man entered my life when I was three. I didn't have much memories before that, and so I was raised in a place of chaos and violence. This man, who I've only ever known as jobless, or at least relatively jobless, was left to look after us on a daily basis as my mother worked and attended community college. How much she knew or seen what she understood was going on at home, I can't say for certain, but I can say she saw enough. Her reasons for not acting are hers, and I don't know that I'll ever accept them, but I also accept that it doesn't really make a difference anyway. Not Nothing changes the past. The most anybody can hope for now is accountability. But, well, the only thing easy about accountability in this situation is saying the word, and obviously that doesn't take us far enough, at least not as far as I would like us to be.
Now, he was left to look after us on a daily basis, but I can't say he done much in the way of actually raising us. His idea of giving me good table manners was to constantly hit me in the back of the head and tell me to sit up straight and get my elbows off the table. But I could never sit up straight enough. Every meal was an ongoing cycle of abuse. Every day I was made to feel small, and I accepted that that's what I was. Believing that lie was the biggest mistake I ever made, and the ramifications of it will likely be with me forever. I never felt sorry for myself and how I was brought up, and I still don't. I just don't think of my life in terms of pity. But I've heard it from friends who I tell these stories to for the first time how sorry they are for me. And that hurts. Because I know they're right. In many ways, I had a very pitiable life. But it was the only life I knew. It was my normal. This all gave me a deep trauma I didn't realize I had until I was 20, when it dawned on me somehow for the first time that nothing in that house was right. It affected my personality such that at times I found myself repeating my stepfather's exact mannerisms anytime a girlfriend and I got into an argument, which at the time was frequent. I was a shitty person. I was made into one. But I wouldn't allow that excuse that I was made into one to keep me being a shitty person forever, so I took accountability for my life. But at this point, we're a little bit off track. So there was a moment around when I was 11 or 12 that got my self-esteem a little more on track. And this is where we come back to Final Fantasy IX. Apologies for the long windup, but I was spending the weekend at a friend's house. Final Fantasy IX probably wasn't new, but he was playing it for seemingly the first time. For those that don't know, Final Fantasy IX predates video games having large amounts of voiceovers. So you could rename characters at will without any issue. As kids, we also weren't sworn to keeping the character names as they were. So my buddy, who I'll refer to simply here as G, had renamed Zidane after himself. He was the hero in the story. Princess Garnet, I really can't remember who he named after. I don't think we'd done much talking to girls back then. I'm not even sure we'd done much talking about girls back then, unless it was which Spice Girl we thought was the hottest. Steiner, he named after my buddy, who I'll call Jay. Jay was the tallest kid in class, ironically the first friend I ever made in school, and my best friend until early adulthood, when we just kind of drifted apart. This was a natural fit for Steiner. Jay had a sort of goofy look and he was a little clumsy and lackadaisical. Then of course, there was Vivi. And what friend better to name him after than the shortest, smallest guy around? Me. When I seen this in his game as he played, I didn't say much about it, but it didn't really hit me in a feel-good way. If anything, it made me feel awkward and insecure. It reinforced all the worst thoughts I already had about myself. I was the smallest guy in class and an even smaller guy at home. And now, I was the smallest guy in a video game. And what's worse? Vivi looked and moved like a toddler. I felt insulted, to be honest. But as I watched him play, there was a cutscene pretty early on. Zidane and crew were being pursued by one of the black mages, when all of a sudden, this happens. This moment hit me and it stuck with me for the rest of my life. Vivi was short, yes, but he wasn't small. At that moment, Vivi was the biggest guy around. Vivi was a badass with potential and power you can't see just by looking at him. I got the wrong impression from him because he was short. So the gear started turning in my head. Am I like this? Is there something more to me as well? Of course, at home, I stood no chance of turning the tide of any battle against my stepfather, and no increase in confidence could make my situation there go away. But I started to find a sense of self-worth for the first time, a belief that there was at least potential there, where I hadn't felt it before. Vivi gave me that. It was a shallow way to come to this realization, but it was an absolutely powerful realization for me. In my early to mid-teens, I would move out of my mother's house and go live with my real father, who I keep a good relationship with today. Though I only really started course correcting the damage that was done to me in my early 20s, it would be a lie to say that the house and the things that happened to me there are wholly a thing of the past. I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder around eight years old and still suffer the effects of it today. But everything I do now, I do despite how I was raised. Everything I am now, I am despite how I was raised. I try to be better than the people who raised me and be better than the person they raised me to be. I found who I am now and I know what I am without their influence, but I still never completely lost that scared kid part of me either, that small, 
worthless child. My upbringing gave me scars that might never heal, but they are a tool for me today. Though it would be somewhat erroneous to say Final Fantasy IX was wholly responsible for the strides I started making at a young age to take back my self-esteem and leave my home life behind, it was at least one of many important stepping stones and realizations that brought me to where I am today. This all brought me to the point today where I can be committed and confident in saying that I'm gonna be a great dad and a great husband that no child of mine, no friend, and no family will ever have to experience the things that I did. I look at my daughter and I can't even begin to understand what kind of monster you would have to be to treat another life that way. And so long as I am alive, I will succeed for her where I had been failed. For all I am, all I've been, and for all I've been through, I will do everything I can to do what's right by her and be the best goddamn parent I can be. <laughs> Hey, baby. Hi. Hey. It's crazy to think about how old Final Fantasy IX is because I was there the, the week that it was released, the day that it was released, and I picked up my copy. And when I think back to all those years ago now, I think of myself in not such a great place in my life. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, I was a smoker. I was single at that time. And uh, yeah, things were kind of on the down. And for two weeks, I ate bologna sandwiches to buy that and a PlayStation 1 screen, just because I had to get it at the time. I'd rather go without food, you know what I mean? To, to play the latest Final Fantasy. This I got when I was like a teenager, I think. And then I actually beat it on the Switch, finally. And the reason is, I played it as a teenager. I don't know, I got to a hard part and then I basically put it down for 20 years. And then the Switch version came out, was a little easier, had accessibility options and hooray, I, I beat it. And I first got it the summer that I graduated high school and was going on into college. It was my game of 2000, that game of the summer for me. And boy, what an experience it was. Everything that I know and love about the series came back for me before I personally had to leave off to college to the big city of Kennesaw. Woo! Yeah, it was just a life-changing experience for me. Me and two other friends at school were having this competition to see who could beat Final Fantasy IX the fastest. So I remember we, you know, we each had a strategy guide or we were doing our own things to try to beat it as fast as possible. And every day we would update each other. And I had a couple friends that were just way better at games than me. I don't even think uh, I ended up beating the game because they just beat me so fast. But then years later, I finally did beat it. And it's one of my favorite Final Fantasies of all time. Final Fantasy IX was not the first RPG I ever played. It wasn't even the first Final Fantasy game I ever played, but it was the first RPG I beat on my first playthrough. I never got bored. I never lost interest. I was just straight up hooked.